anyway, all that joking aside, so I, it was an interesting week. I learned some new stuff. I couldn't help myself, and I messed with the notes, okay? So what you have in front of you right now or that you should have picked up off the back table is the notes that we're going to be working off of, and they're the ones that I have up here. Next week, though, I will need you to bring the outstanding, the, the rest of the notes from last week, lesson 190, that we didn't finish because I plan on covering those uh, next week, and I, that would then become lesson 192. All right, but uh, just stuff just happened this week where I'm like, yeah, this is too good. I, I have to, uh, I have to address this. So are we on YouTube? All right, great. So we should be on all three of our spots and things seemingly, at least for the time being, are good. Knock on wood, like a pagan Gentile. Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Lesson 191, uh, if the AV 1611, Assessing is Preliminary Contents Part Two, title page and epistle dedicatory. Let's get right into the introduction. Is Sylvia out? I didn't even know she was having surgery. Um, Amy, would you mind if we need to note any changes, um, writing them on your page for me so I can uh, make them after the fact? Mm -hmm. All right, introduction. In lesson 190, we began the process of assessing the preliminary contents of the AV of 1611. Our purpose is to understand the 1611 as a historical artifact, what was included, and what it can tell us about the life and times of the King James translators. So I brought with me my smaller edition today of a 1611. Uh, this was published by Thomas Nelson. This is the one that I mentioned. I think I brought this a few weeks ago. This is advertised as a word-for-word -word reprint of the first edition of the authorized version presented in Roman letters for easy reading and comparison with subsequent editions. So this is a Roman type reprint of a 1611. At least that is the way that it is being uh, advertised by Thomas Nelson. Um, in doing the research for these classes, I've realized that I'm sort of disappointed with this edition because I don't think it is wholly what it is advertising itself to be, and uh, we'll get into that probably next time. But we want to look at the 1611 as a historical artifact, all right? What was in it? What did they include? And what does that tell us about where they were at and the day and time in which that it was produced in the early 17th century? To accomplish this, we began following closely with Oxford professor Gordon Campbell's book, The Story of the King James Version, 1611 to 2011. Well, there are other books that talk about aspects of the contents found in the AV of 1611, Campbell's is the most complete. Dr. Campbell offers the following physical description of the 1611 King James Bible. And so we're, um, we're going to reread re -read at least set some of this from last week. Regarding the preliminary material, Dr. Campbell stated the following, quote, At the beginning of most surviving copies, there is a thick section of preliminaries, 74 pages. So if you were to look at a 1611 folio, before you even get to the biblical text, there's 74 pages of preliminary information in the 1611. All right? They include a title page, a dedicatory, a dedicatory epistle to King James, a preface from the translators to the reader, a calendar, an almanac, a table for the calculation of Easter, a table and calendar setting out the order of the psalms and lessons to be said at morning prayers throughout the year, a list of the books of the Testaments and the Apocrypha, the royal coat of arms, and the Latin phrase, uh, Latin phrase indication that the book was printed, quote, by authority of the king, genealogies, a table of the place names in Canaan, and then a map of Canaan. So there are 74 pages of preliminary materials, including all of those elements that we just went through in that list, okay? Um, in Lesson 190, we began the process of looking at the preliminary material by discussing the meaning and significance of the artwork found on the title page, all right? So again, that is this title page right here. If you recall, last Sunday we went through and explained what all of the artwork on the title page means and what it is intending to communicate to the reader, all right? So we did that last time in Lesson 190. Before moving on, we have an additional observation to make regarding the title page. 
So if you look at it at the bottom of the page, we're at the point where it says title page continued at the bottom of page one, right? So, uh, and again, I just want to be clear, so I'm going to leave this image up. So this is lesson 190. And what we're going to be talking about is this language right here in the center appointed to be read in the churches, right? So let's look at the bottom of page one, title page continued. The phrase appointed to be read in the churches in the center of the title page is an important phrase in my mind for a few reasons. So this is the point we left off with last time. First, as I discussed in lesson 182, <clears throat> when we were discussing the notes of John Boyce during the general meeting, the text was subjected to a final aureole review and fine-tuned for how it would sound when it was read out loud in a church service. Okay? So we talked, we talked about this before, that Elizabethan aesthetic, the uh, sort of the, um, the Hamletized soul of the age, if you will, that, that the Shakespearean theory, theater was the culmination of the um, Renaissance in England, and that the translators were all raised in that culture, and their ears were very tuned, and they were very sensitive to how things would sound when they were read out loud. One, to me, one of the biggest misconceptions people have about the King James Bible is that the language of it was the contemporary language of the age, the way people normally spoke. That's not true. Things like the extended verb endings and stuff like that had already sort of fallen out of usage uh, in a lot of ways. But they, are, they do those things for the effect and the, the way it will sound when the text is read out loud. Okay, because it's, again, intended to be what? Appointed to be read where? In churches. That was the initial point of it, all right? So back to the notes. First, as I discussed in Lesson 182, when we were discussing the notes of John Boyce, during the general meeting, the text was subject to an RL review and fine-tuned for how would sound was read out loud in the church service. Second, I think it speaks to the grandness of the size of the first folio edition, which was clearly designed to be a pulpit Bible for use in public worship. So that is the original intent, okay? Now, we know already that in subsequent years, starting in 1612 and following, was it printed in smaller, personal size formats for people to use and read personally, okay? Which obviously would have been much cheaper, too, to buy, all right? So as we have seen, smaller size Bibles for personal use would come later. So we're out to top of page two of the notes for Lesson 191, all right? Helen Moore and Julian Reed, the editors of Manifold Greatness, the making of the King James Bible for the Bodleian Library, devoted an entire section to this topic, and it's worth noting here. So we're going to look at this quote from Moore and Reed on the idea of the, the King James Bible being produced for public reading. All right? So they say, quote, The Bible in early modern England was not only read privately, but also heard. Domestic devotional practices of the period included the reading of the Bible out loud, an exercise which often brought all together all the social elements of the household from the head of the house to the servants. The way most English people encountered the Bible, however, was when it was read aloud in public worship in parish churches. Parish worship was, in the words of one historian, quote, a soundscape. Okay, so it's very auditory. Very aureole. It's very based on hearing it, the text being read out loud in public worship. He's, this particular author calls it a soundscape. The epistle dedicatory to the King James Bible maintained that the aim of the translators was that, quote, God's holy truth will be yet more and more known unto the people professing the great hope of the Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby. This goal was accomplished in no small part by the new translation's role in public worship. The translators were not saying something new, but building on centuries of reading the Bible aloud in divine services, as well as over a half century of doing so in the vernacular. Okay? They say in the preface that it was not their aim to make a new translation, but to make of many translations one principal good one not to be just, justly expected against. That's what they say in the preface. So they clearly view their work as revisory, 
of prior work that had been done. We already know this, right? We know that rule one said that they were to start with the bishops and revise it only as the truth of the original called for. And as they revised it, they were supposed to compare it to prior English Bibles. Okay, we've been over this probably ad nauseum, right? Just a reminder here. So there's a, there's, a, there's a culture now of the Bible being read out loud in English, in the vernacular, that has been occurring now in England for at least 50 years when we get to the point of the publication of the King James. Okay? In fact, the very process of translation for the King James Bible involved members of various committees hearing verses read aloud. Okay? The preface to the 1599 Book of Common Prayer stated that the early fathers of the church maintained, quote, that the people by the daily hearing of the scripture read in the church shall continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God. So part of this is the idea exactly as it says on the title page of that it's appointed to be read where? In the churches. Okay? Um, in contradiction to St. Paul's injunction to have worship conducted in quote, such a language spoken to the people, and they might, um, sorry, as they might understand and have profit by hearing of the same, the preface to the Book of Common Prayer lamented that for many centuries after Latin had ceased to be the vernacular, the Bible was still read in that tongue, quote, so that they have heard with their ears only and not been edified thereby. So the Common Book of Prayer is lamenting the fact that until the Reformation era, when the people heard the, church, the Bible read out loud, they heard it in what language? Latin. And did any of them understand it? No. no. Okay. Very few, unless they were educated, understood it. Richard Hooker, one of the most tenacious defenders of the Elizabethan settlement, remarked, quote, Touching the use of Scripture openly read, it brings about in inestimable, inestimable good within the church of God by the very by the very mean hath reaped. So in other words, are the common folks benefiting from hearing the Bible read out loud in their language? Okay? Hooker went further than edification as a reason for reading the scriptures aloud in public worship. Quote, I see not how we should possibly wish a proof more palpable then this manifest, then this manifest received an everywhere continued custom of reading them publicly as the scriptures. The reading thereof as the word of God, as use hath ever been in open audience, is the plainest evidence we have of the church's assent and acknowledgement that it is his word. So he is saying that the public reading of the Bible in the church service is an attestation to the fact that that the people believe what they are hearing to be what? God's word. Okay, that's what he's saying. Since the Reformation, the Bible yoke fellow in its role as a text for the public worship of God had been the book of common prayer. So let's stop there. We in this church are non-denominational. We do not follow the liturgy of any uh, organized denominational sacerdotal church. Okay, so some of what he's about to say is going to be a little bit foreign to our experience. You cannot separate, though, what he's going to say from the experience of the people living in the early 17th century when the King James Bible was produced. Okay, it was very much still a liturgical society. And yes, there were Puritans that disagreed with and wanted to reform further aspects of that liturgy. But it was still very much the practice of the Anglican Church of the day to follow what the liturgy called for. So the Bible, along with the Book of Common Prayer, were the two most important things. And the, the Book of Common Prayer, as you'll see in a minute, spelled out and specified what parts of the Bible the people should be what? Reading during certain times of the year. Because that was all part of the liturgy. Okay, so again... For us today, in the 21st century, as a non-denominational Bible church that is not following a liturgy, not following a denomination, some of this is going to seem a little bit foreign to us. But if you're going to understand the way the King James Bible was received at the time that it was produced in the early 17th century, you can't separate these things. Okay, so let's look at 
bottom of page two. <coughs> Since the Reformation, the Bible yoke fell in its role as a text for public worship had been the Book of Common Prayer. Its preface maintained that unlike the liturgical observances of the medieval church, which needed a small library to perform, uh, quote, curates shall need none other books for their public service, but this book and the Bible. So in other words, because of the Reformation in England, there were two books that were significant. Number one, the Bible, and number two, the Book of Common Prayer. So did you need a library full of Latinate information based at, at this point? They're, they're saying no. Um, uh, where am I at here? Further, the prayer book directed through tales of readers for the year which parts of the Bible should be read in public services. The daily lectionary largely directed reading through a book of the Old Testament and the New Testament in order, resulting in a large portion of the Bible being read aloud in the course of a, of a year. Lessons appointed for Communion Sundays and Holy Days reflected the themes of the church year shaped around the events in the life of Christ or a saint's day. So obviously there's aspects of this liturgy that I would not be okay with, okay? But you can't separate that from the time period in which the, the King James first came out. Next paragraph, page 3. A striking thing about worship in conformity to the Book of Common Prayer was the sheer amount of of the Bible in English to which congregations were exposed. On Sunday, inhabitants of a, quote, conforming parish, that is, that is, one in which worship was conducted according to the prayer book, would hear read an Old and New Testament passage plus psalms and morning prayer, and then the epistle and gospel passages for the service of anti-communion or the full service if communion was taking place. Evening prayer had the same structure as morning prayer. In other words, congregants were exposed to at least six passages of Scripture per day, as well as a number of psalms. Psalm singing, often in uh, metrical translation, grew in popularity in parish churches after the Reformation. The, pair, the prayer book itself reproduced a translation of the Henrician Great Bible. So that would be the 1539 Great Bible authorized by Henry VIII. Okay? So that's what it means by Henry Sian. So in other words, does the prayer book have the verses printed in English according to a 1539 Great Bible? That's what that means, okay? So the prayer book itself reproduced the translation of the Henry Sian Great Bible for the epistle and gospel readings for the communion service on Sunday and major holy days and for the liturgical psalter. During Elizabeth's reign, the translation of all the other public readings of the Bible came from either the official Bishop's Bible, 1568, or the widely used but unauthorized Geneva Bible. It was the role, it was this role, the 1611 Bible was expected to fulfill. The King James Bible did not replace the Great Bible for the common readings until the revisions of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. So two things there. In 1662 is the Book of Common Prayer revised and the King James text put in there in place of the Great Bible text. That's what that means. And in the prior sentence, it was this role that the Bible was expected to fill. So when it says, appointed to be read in the churches... They mean that it should be read where? In the churches. So when the churches do their public reading, from here on out, the expectation is they're going to do it out of what Bible? The King James. Okay, That is, that is the um, expectation. And we know that James did not like the Geneva Bible. And we also know from the Hampton Court study that did he find issue with all of the, in James's mind, were there issues in some way, shape, or form with all of the prior English Bibles, thus prompting him to want there to be a what? A new one. So we've studied all that, okay? The structures provided by the prayer book therefore exposed the laity, whether they could read or not, and whether they could afford their own Bible or not, to a considerable, uh, to considerable portions of the scriptures Sunday by Sunday. 
The Reformation emphasis on hearing clearly what was said or sung in church necessitated some recognition of internal church uh, some reorganization, excuse me, of internal church architecture, and from Elizabeth's reign onwards, the provision of new pulpits, reading desks, and lecterns, often with sounding boards to aid these new requirements. By 1611, therefore, the laity had come to expect to be able to be active hearers of God's word openly read where? In church. So there is a cultural expectation at the time that this Bible is largely produced to fill, and that is to be the Bible that is read where? In church, and thus exposing the, the laity to the scriptures, whether they could read or not. Thus the emphasis on the Elizabethan aesthetic that we discussed in Lesson 182. The King James translators fine-tuned the English text with an ear for how it would sound when it was read audibly in church. Put another way, the Word of God needed to sound like the Word of God, i.e. majestic. The King James Bible fulfilled this purpose perfectly for centuries. All right? Um... I am not a big follower of the royal family, but I believe it was some years ago when, what is the oldest of Diana's boy's name again? Charles. Just Charles, Charles, right? Harry. Harry, no, Harry's the, the young brat that's rebelling. Charles, is it Charles? What's the name of the kid? William, that's it, William. At his wedding, I listened, I watched the wedding only to hear, to see if they would read from the King James. They didn't. It, it irritated me immensely that they did not do that. Here you have the, a royal wedding, and they're reading from a modern English Bible. It was very irritating to me. But anyway, I don't want to get off on all, all that. So, the... <laughs> So the, the idea of this being appointed to be read in the churches is extremely significant for understanding how and what they did and the amount of Bible that they would have heard in the church because of what was being uh, called for by the liturgy of the common book of prayer exposed people to massive sections of the Bible throughout the year if they, if they attended the church service. Okay. Now, any questions before we move on? Yeah. Why do you think it took 51 years for it to get into the church of the like in the Old Testament? You mean for them to revise the prayer book? Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, I think there's a multitude of factors that uh, I plan on doing a lesson on in the future, and that is to look at like the early sales and response of the population to the publication of the King James. Um, I, I'm not prepared to get into specific details because I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but um, it took a while, it took a little bit of time for the King James to replace the bishops in the Geneva as the Bible of choice in the English-speaking world. Um, not everybody, you know, a lot of, some, some, some King James advocates have this idea that the English-speaking world just, you know, as soon as it came off the press, they were like, finally, God's word in English. Okay, and I'm not saying there weren't some people that maybe thought that way, but, but it wasn't that cut and dry. There was, there was a process that took place by which the King James kind of within the, by the end of its first 50 years had finally sort of supplanted the Geneva and the, um, uh, the bishops in, in the churches. And there doesn't seem to have been Bart, a, a royal decree or injunction for a church to immediately buy a 1611 folio for their church. But if their Bible was wearing out and they needed a new one, the expectation certainly would have been that they would have bought, that they would buy the new one. And I think that what really sort of tipped the scales in favor of the King James is the production of the smaller size individual Bibles that people could buy for use in their home. That, I think, is what ultimately is going to tip, tip that. And then eventually, um, with the restoration, there's also political stuff that happens in England with the English Civil War. 
Um, when the Puritans under Cromwell take over, they basically ban the Crown's Bible and, and try to make the Geneva Bible the official Bible. But then that doesn't go well. Then there's a restoration of the monarchy back to the throne. And around that same time of that restoration is when you see them redoing the uh, Book of Common Prayer and bringing it up to the King James sort of updated, if I could say it that way. Now that's just a 10,000 foot view summary. There are definitely more details uh, that need to be discussed on all of the points that I just mentioned, but that's sort of a high view of it, okay? In just, a, in a summary form. Okay, anybody else? Now before the King James Bible, there were other English Bibles. Sure, there were a bunch of them. Yeah, but when were the first ones written? Well, you had Wycliffe's Bible from the 1380s, which was handwritten, translation of the Latin into Middle English. And then you have Tyndall publishing on the press the first, the first English translation of the Greek in 1526. In 1530, he does the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Then... He does more translation work that is not published until after he dies. He is burnt, he is burnt, killed as a martyr. Coverdale does a whole Bible in 1535, which is done largely out of Latin and German because he was not proficient in Hebrew and Greek. Coverdale wasn't. Then you have the Matthews Bible, 1537, which in my opinion, and I, this is the way I taught it, is the complete work of William Tyndall. Rogers, who did it, uh, did it under the pseudonym Matthew's Bible, he included basically the Tyndall New Testament and all of Tyndall's work that he had done up until he died, and then he filled in the missing work by, by uh, using Coverdale. In 1539, Coverdale revised the Matthew's Bible into what would become the Great Bible, and then there was no Bible from 1539. There was a Traveler's Bible. It, was a, it, it wasn't really... It was sort of a minor edition, I guess I'll just say. It wasn't necessarily very popularly used or sold very much, or did it go through very many editions. And then you, you have to wait then until 1557 for the Geneva New Testament, 1556 for the whole Geneva Bible, 1568 for the Bishop's Bible. And then the King James is coming in 1611. Uh, we're all holy of five? Uh, I... I'm going to say no, but I don't know for sure. I know some of them were, uh, some of them probably were not. Before the printed Bible made it, you know, cheaper to obtain, were they all handwritten yep. by scribes and only available in, for churches? Or <clears throat> who, who would no, I mean, at that point, when, when, when Wycliffe's Bible was done by hand, Every manuscript was hand copied, and they were banned. They were the, the Catholic Church was destroying them because they did not want the Bible in the vernacular language, so and that's why they. And so by that, so that was in the 1380s yeah. into the 1400s. By the time you get into the first half of the 15th century, you have the Reformation, and the political situation is different, and things start to change. But one of the reasons why William Tyndall is burnt at the stake is because he translated the Bible into English out of the Greek. And they didn't want that. So when you went to church in the 1200s, it was probably a Catholic church, and did they translate? Or no, say they read it out of Latin. So it was, this is what they were getting at. If they were just saying stuff that people didn't understand. They said a bunch of gibberish. Nobody understood it. Really? Yep. You're going to like that book I gave you. Yep. Because it's gonna, it mentions all of that stuff in there. <laughs> okay. The, the whole, good, good questions. The whole mass was done in Latin. Yeah. Other yeah, well, I understand that, but they didn't even summary of it? No, that's church? why the, um, What was no. the point of going to church then? <laughs> because it was your religious duty. To this day, they still had, they do not read out of the Bible. Huh. Well, that depends, no, because no, Vatican no. II changed that. But until the ni middle of the 19th century, middle of the 1900s, the church was still reading and doing the Mass out of Latin. The Vatican II Council, they changed that, and they allowed for the Bible to be read in, in the common tongue. Uh, but that hasn't even been 100 years. But see, it's a mass book that they have this day. It's yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they still follow the Catholic liturgy, but yeah. they'll at least allow for the Bible to be read in English from an approved Catholic translation. Okay. 
All right, the epistle dedicatory. So the next item found, so that would, so here's the title page. All right. If you turn to the next page in the 1611, you will find the epistle dedicatory. All right. So the next item found in the preliminary material, the 1611 King James Bible, was a dedicatory epistle to King James. So go to the top page four. So here it is. This is, I just took a screenshot of the heading. It says, to the most high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc. The translators of the Bible wish grace, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is a letter dedicating the volume to who? Mm -hmm. To the king. That's the first, that's the next, after the title page, that is the next item you will find, okay? The epistle dedicatory is six paragraphs long and spans three pages in the 1611. Dr. Campbell states the following regarding it, quote, the King James Version is dedicated to the most high and mighty Prince James by the grace of God, King of Britain, Great Britain, France, Ireland. The country of Great Britain existed only in the mind of King James. He wanted Scotland, he wanted England and Scotland to unite, but they were not to do so until 1707, almost a century later. Now, I just have to say, <laughs> when we, when I teach British geography at school, kids get all confused because they don't understand that Great Britain is also the name of the hunk of Ireland. There are two countries on Great Britain, England and what? Scotland. But the whole, the, the technical name of the whole chunk of rock that the two countries are on is Great Britain. So it is I'm not sure that the statement is referring to a political Great Britain in the way that we understand a united Great Britain of Scotland and England being united, or if the statement should be understood to be a reference to the fact that James was king of both countries that were on the chunk of rock known as Great Britain, because was he already king of Scotland before he became king of England? Okay. You guys are following what I'm saying? Some of you look like my world history students. Where you're <laughs> like, what? Plus you have Wales, too. Wales, yes, Wales is also on Great Britain. James would have been considered king of that as well, okay, by the standards of the day, as far as I understand. So, the claim, of the, the, the claim to the throne of France was a vestige of a claim first made in 1340 and not withdrawn until 1810. Ten years after the throne of France had ceased to exist. The dedication king, in the dedication, King James is said to be, quote, the principal mover, mover and author of the work. This is not meant to imply that he contributed to the process of revision, but rather that it was his commission that made it happen. The author of the dedication is not known, but as the style seems different from that of Miles Smith, who wrote the preface on behalf of the translators, the obvious candidate would seem to be Thomas Bilson, Bishop of Winchester. So remember that Bilson and Smith are the ones that put the final touches on it. If you compare the grammar and syntax to the, of the epistle dedicatory with the preface that follows this, it, they, it seems like they may have been written by different people, although that's speculation to say that Bilson wrote it, no one really knows. We, d we are very confident, though, that Miles Smith wrote the preface. So look at the bottom of page four. The first three paragraphs of the epistle are mostly high-level flattery directed at King James. Okay? If I could say it in the common, vulgar tongue, it's butt-kissing is what it is. They are kissing his rear. He's paying the bills. Significantly. Okay? Um, some aren't going to like that I said it that way, but that it's, it's extremely, you know, over the top flattery of how grand and wonderful the king was. Okay, um, for us Americans who you know aren't supposed to be ruled by a king, it's a little bit off-putting. Okay, so the fourth and fifth paragraphs, however, merit our attention. In the fourth paragraph, the king's role in the production of the AV is addressed. 
Please note that I have updated the spelling for ease of, ease of reading. We need a parenthesis closing that after the, the period. So if you go to page five, I gave you a screenshot of the paragraph and right underneath it, I gave you just the updated spelling of it. All right, just so you could see that I was not playing fast and loose with things here. Let's look at what it says. <coughs> he says, this, this is paragraph four. There are many infinite arguments as to the right Christian and religious affection in your majesty, but none is more forci uh, forcible to declare it to others uh, than the vehement and perpetuated. perpetuated desire of the accomplishment and publishing of this work. So in other words, what is the thing that testifies to the king's, you know, um, religious affection more than anything else? Publication. The publication of this Bible, this work, okay? Uh, which now, with all humility, we present unto your majesty. Now watch the next part. From when your highness had at once out of deep judgment apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues together with comparing the labors both of our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went before us, watch, that there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Okay? Your Majesty never did never desist to urge and to excite those to whom it was commended that the work might be hastened and that the business might be uh, expedited in, in so decent a manner as a matter of such importance might justly require. Now, that's a mouthful. Okay, but I think we can understand basically what he means, okay? Now, as we will see in a future lesson, the preface, the translators to the reader, is often rhetorically leveraged by those seeking to score points for their position on both sides of the Bible version debate. So the next thing we're going to encounter in the preliminary information is the preface. People on both sides of the version translational textual debate they both seek to leverage the preface to score points for their side of the argument. You follow what I'm saying? Okay? And therefore sort of cast the translators as being on their side of the debate as it happens in modern times. Okay? That said, I have seen little to no discussion of this paragraph from the epistle dedicatory. Though that's the paragraph we just quoted. The author, whoever it was, now watch, attributes to, quote, the king's judgment, the production of, quote, one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. How should we understand this phrase in an early 17th century context? Okay, now let's look at this sentence again. So right here. For when your highness had once out of deep judgment... So who are they crediting with having the judgment, the discernment, the wherewithal to know this needed to be done? James. James, okay? Apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues, so that would be the Hebrew and what? Greek, okay? Together with comparing the labors. So they're going to, so understand, they're going to use the Hebrew and Greek, and they're going to compare the Hebrew and Greek to the labors of others. Right? Okay? Both in our own and other foreign languages. So are they going to take the Hebrew and Greek, compare it to prior English Bibles, as well as translations in other foreign languages? That's what it means, right? And do we already know from our prior studies that that's exactly what they did? Okay? Now watch. Of many worthy men who went before us, here. There should be one more exact translation. So do that. This is saying that James perceived there needed to be what? Another one. And one more exact translation 
of the Holy Scriptures into the English what? Tongue. Okay? Now, when you look at that statement, where do you think the controversy is going to be? It's not fair because I highlighted it. What does this mean? Exact. What does this mean? Exact. Okay? So let's look at this. So, what we want to do is we want to try to understand what this word meant in this early 17th century context. Let's look at the next point. Instead of looking at Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language from 1828, which is more than 200 years removed from the publication of the AV in 1611, we need to consider the meaning of the word in late 16th and early 17th centuries. You follow that? Okay? If I look it up in the Webster Dictionary, is it more than 200 years older than when the translation was done? So, Luckily, we have tools to do these things. Look at the next point. In 1604, the same year work commenced on the publication of the AV, Robert Cowdery published a table alphabetical of hard, unusual English words. Cowdery's table possesses the following entry for the English word exact. Notice, perfectly what? Done. Done. Okay, so here is the screenshot from the table alphabetical. Here's the entry for exact. And what did it mean in 1604? Perfectly done. So when they're saying exact translation, how are they using the word exact? Okay? Let's keep going. Now remember a minute ago I told you about people who, who want to leverage the preface. I have a book here, came out last year, The Forgotten Preface, and it's kind of doing that exact thing, and uh, there's uh, number four, thesis number four, says, the King James translators believed, no, nope, that's not the right one, Pre thesis five, the King James translators did not believe their translation was perfect. Okay? What did they call it? In the epistle dedicatory. They call it what? Exact. exact. If you look up the word exact in a contemporary dictionary with the King James Bible, the word exact means what? Perfectly, Perfectly done. So what's going on here? How can, how can a modern reader or author in the 21st century say that they did not believe that their work was perfect when they called it exact? And when you look up the word exact in a dictionary, contemporary dictionary, the word exact means what? Perfectly. perfectly done. Now, most of the time, when you and I hear the word perfect, how do we think of that word? We hear the word perfect and we think that it is without blemish, faultless, flawless, that kind of a thing, right? Well, might there have been a meaning of the word perfect and the meaning of a word exact back to more than 400 years ago that we are not aware of today because of change in language. Okay? So, a few years prior, in 1596, Edmund Cudi published the English Schoolmaster that contained a similar definition for exact to the one published by Cowdery in 1604. It says, i.e. perfect. So now we have two sources one from the late 16th century, one from the early 17th century, saying that there was a meaning and usage of the word exact at that time that meant perfect or perfectly what? Done. Okay? Meanwhile, the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, presents the following meaning for the adjective form of exact. So, here's exact, perfect, consummate, finished. So here's the exact adjective meaning. You come down here, notice, perfect, consummate, finished, of qualities, conditions, attainments, and you'll notice that this is marked what? Obsolete. Obsolete, meaning what? That this meaning and definition is no longer what? Used. Used, okay? Let's go back to the notes. In addition to the main definition, note the contents of the etymology section on the origin and usage of the word. Derived from the Latin exactus, the word carries meanings related to consummate, complete, and bringing to perfection, okay? 
Second, note that the meaning of the word is now obsolete in modern usage. Okay, so let's look at this. So in the late 16th and early 17th century, there was a meaning of the word exact that meant perfectly done, according to the table alphabetical, and perfected, according to the OED. We can add perfect, according to um, Kuti. Okay? So, therefore, by the standards of the day, the author of the epistle dedicatory is crediting the king is crediting the king's judgment with having perfected the English Bible by providing for one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue, i.e., what? The King James Bible. Now, is everybody following what I'm saying at this point? Okay, so let's go on. Now, this, of course, raises the question of what did the English word perfect mean in the late 16th and early 17th century when the author of the epistle dedicatory ascribed this quality to the AV. The word perfect does, no, uh, does not have its own entry in the 1604 table alphabetical, but it was used to define the following words by Robert Cundry. Okay, absolute, exquisite, and mature. So if you look up the word absolute, exquisite, and mature in the table alphabetical, one of the words to define those words is perfect. You with me? So, this tells us that in the early 17th century when the AV was translated, that perfect possessed multiple different meanings in English. Readers of the AV know this to be the case when they encounter verses like 2 Timothy 3.17 that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. The word perfect in this verse means mature, as recorded in the table alphabetical. You guys following me? Okay, top page seven. The OED elaborates upon this meaning of the word perfect during the time period in question with more detail than we can cover in this lesson. It is instructive to note that there is a connection between exact and perfect in definition 6b. Notice, quote, accurate, correct, of a copy, representation, accurately reproducing or reflecting the original, of a notion, thought, record, and then here it is, exactly corresponding to what? The facts. The facts. Okay, so here it is, a picture of it. Here's 6B, accurate, correct. So this is the definition of perfect. Accurate, correct, accurately reproducing or reflecting the original of a notion thought record exactly corresponding to the facts. And you'll notice that it's also marked what? Obsolete, okay? And to add insult to injury, look at the word usage choices. There's one you will see here from 1611, from the preface, speaking about the um, LXX, the Septuagint, that, that the translation was not so sound and so what? Perfect. Meaning, the LXX was not accurate, correct, accurately representing or reflecting the original, or accurately corresponding to the facts. In other words, were there problems with it? Okay? You with me? So, are they saying that their work was perfect? They are. they are. By this definition, do they think that their work is accurate, correct, and accurately re reproducing and reflecting the original? Do they think that their work in their Bible is an accurate reflection in English of what the original text says? Yes. yes. So did they think it was perfect by that definition? Yes. yes. Did they think it was exact by that definition? Yes. And notice that exact is used in the definition. So, there's a lot made right now in discourse about this, about uh, as a result of uh, Brother Mark Ward's book, Authorized the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible, about false friends. And I'm submitting that there are false friends in the epistle dedicatory and in the preface itself that have not been accurately understood in the discourse of this conversation. Because when you look up the words by the standards of the day, you realize that did they think their work was exact and perfect by this definition? 
The answer is what? Yes. Okay? Now, I have more to say on that when we look at the preface. Let's keep going, though. Note two things about the above image from the OED. So that's this image right here. Okay? First, one of the provided word usage examples is from Miles Smith's famous preface to the AV. Second, this usage is now obsolete. This is precisely what the author of the epistle dedicatory meant when he wrote, quote, one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue, i.e., that the translator's work was accurate and correct, re what was an accurate and correct reproduction of the original, thereby, quote, exactly corresponding to the facts. Put another way, the translators viewed their work as an exact slash perfect reproduction of the original language text in English. Did they think they had made any misrepresentation of the text? No. They didn't. The epistle dedicatory says so, and when you look up the meaning of the words, you realize what they actually meant when they said these things, okay? Adding another layer of evidence for this argument, adding another layer of evidence for this argument, we can also look at the entry in the Middle English Dictionary for the word parfit. In Middle English, the middle in the Middle English, the word parfit, for the word parfit, we, we need to change this. It should say something like, it is the Middle English equivalent of the word perfect. Note the fifth definition of the word. Exact, precise, corresponding exactly to a type or standard. That's exactly the way that they are using the word perfect in the epistle dedicatory when they say to make one more exact translation of the Bible into what? English. Okay? Notice that the English word parfit is defined as exact. A word that meant perfectly done according to the 1604 table alphabetical. So the statement under investigation from the epistle dedicatory should be paired with the following line penned by Miles Smith in the preface to the 1611, quote, Truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not to not justly to be expected against, that hath been our endeavor, our what? Our mark. Now look, guys, that matches that matches basically this line that we're talking about here from the epistle dedicatory. Again, look at it again. For your highness hath once set out of deep judgment, apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues together comparing of the labors both in our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went before us that there should be what? One more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into what? The English tongue. Are they claiming that this is exact, perfect, and in, in the sense of accurately, correctly representing and reproducing the contents of the original in English? That's what they're saying. That is exactly what they're saying. Okay, so I'll go back to page 7. That's the page we're on, right? I guess we need to flip over to page 8. <clears throat> the King James Translator... Wait, let me stop there. The word perfect occurs more than once in the preface. When it occurs in the preface, it is used in more than one way. Okay. Let me show you. Perfect occurs seven times in the preface. This is the comment that is used by the OED. In the word usage example, it is certain that that translation, referring to the Septuagint, was not so sound and so perfect. This is the word usage example for perfect. Come on. Uh, 
Chimney. So here it is, 6B. Accurate, correct. This is the definition. Here it is. Miles 6011, Miles Smith. That translation was not so sound and so perfect. So this meaning of perfect, this use of perfect means what? This, right? There's another occurrence of the word perfect in the preface that means something different. That means fall faultless, without uh, blemish. Here it is. Or that, look at this statement here. For whatever was perfect under the sun, where apostles or apostolic men, that is, so he's defining perfect here, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privileged with the privilege of infallibility. So when perfect is used in this sentence, does it mean unable to err perfect? Why? Because are these men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit? This is a different meaning and usage of perfect. The word perfect occurs in the preface more than once and has different meanings depending on the context in which it appears. And there's a meaning of the word perfect that correlates with exact, that has the idea, again, if we go back over here, it means exactly what this says. Accurate, correct. Accurately reproducing and reflecting the original. Exactly corresponding to the facts. Obsolete. When they say they made an exact translation, exact, according to the table alphabetical, means perfectly done. They viewed it as perfect, but by what definition of perfect? By the definition of perfect that we see here in 6b, not by the meaning that they were inspired in the same way Paul and James and John and Luke were when they originally wrote what? But that does not stop them from ascribing the quality of exactness or perfectness to what they did. They felt like it was an accurate reflection and representation in English of what the original language text what? Said. You following me? Bottom of page 8. Top of page 8. Am I in the right spot? No. Hang on. Sorry, I've got to move quick. The King James translators, according to their own terminology, compared prior English Bibles with the original sacred tongues, along with other foreign language Bibles, to produce, quote, one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Their estimation of their work was that it was exact i.e. perfectly done and that it was that it was accurate correct and accurately reproducing and reflecting the original put another way they viewed their work as perfectly representing the contents of the original sacred tongues in english you guys following that okay and they did so while rejecting verbatim identicality of wording as the standard this is evidenced by the section of the preface where Smith explains that they, quote, that they had, quote, not tied themselves to a uniformity of phrasing or to an identity of words when doing their work. This is further evidenced by the alternative readings offered in the margins of the AV. I will have more to say about this issue in a standalone video I plan to make in the future, okay, in the near future. So they don't, ex they don't say that it has to be the same throughout in order to be accurate. They think it is accurate. They think it is exactly correct the way that they stated things. By the meaning and definition of exact that I presented to you from 17th century sources. You guys following this? So is it correct to say that they did not view their work as perfect? I would say it depends what you mean by perfect. Because did perfect mean more than one thing? But did they view it as perfect, exact, and accurate representing the truth of the original? Absolutely they did. So are there any known, mis are, are there any known misrepresentations of the original text in the AV according to them? No. Even in places where it was hard. We'll see what they said about that in a future lesson. So... The fifth paragraph of the epistle dedicatory, we got to move quick because we're running out of time and i got to set up for church. 
And the, the fifth paragraph of the epistle dedicatory is also worthy of note. In this paragraph, the author leverages the king's approval and sanctioning of the work against those who would seek to cast dispersion upon it. Quote, we need a quotation mark there at the beginning of that. <laughs> and now at last, by the mercy of God and the continuance of our labors, it being brought unto such a conclusion <clears throat> as that we have great hopes that the Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby, we hold it our duty to offer it to your majesty, not only, at, not only as to our king and sovereign, but as the principal mover and author of the work, humbly craving of your most sacred majesty, that since things of this quality have ever been subject to the censures of ill-meaning and discontented persons, it may receive uh, approbation and patronage from so learned and judicious a prince as your highness is, whose allowance and acceptance of our labor shall more honor and encourage us than all the um, calumations, right? Is that right? Calumations? Yeah. Calumations and hard um, interpretations of other men shall dismay us. So that if on one side we shall be... Um, trounced by popish persons at home or abroad who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto his people whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness. They're saying, we know there's going to be Catholics that attack this. That's what they're saying, right? Or if on the other side we shall be maligned by self-conceited brethren who run their own ways and give liking unto nothing but what was framed by themselves and hammered on their anvil, we may, we may rest secure, supported within by truth and innocency of good conscience, having walked the ways of simplicity and integrity and before the Lord, as before the Lord, and sustained without by the powerful protection of your majesty's grace and favor, and will ever give countenance to honest and Christian endeavors against bitter censures and uncharitable interpretations. So in other words, if the king approves it, will that go a long way to dispelling those who would seek to castigate it on either side? Essentially what they're driving at. So a proper reading of the preface cannot be separated from the insights provided by the epistle dedicatory. The translators viewed their work as perfect by the standard identified above. We will say more about the preface in future lessons. Okay? Now, we got to quit. We're past time. Um, I got to end the stream. If there's any questions that anybody has, um, you can ask them while we pick up the equipment. But I appreciate your attention. Next Sunday, we'll move on with. So, next Sunday, you need to bring those other notes. The notes you forgot, okay? You're all unprepared for class, some of you, okay?